Good morning, everyone. How are you? Good. Um, I've been able to see some of the previous presentations, uh, and especially Kay, I think that was a great presentation. And we'll stitch in to hear some of the things around data engineering and how does that work in an analytics operating model. So before I talk about that, like why should you listen to me, you can choose not to. There's still people standing outside. Um, <laughs> Right, so I've been in the analytics space for about 15 years now, um, but not just in analytics, analytics within sustainability. So I'm a climate change warrior. I think presidential candidate Jay Inslee has it right. This is the biggest problem facing our generation. Um, and so I could certainly be working at Facebook or Eat24 or DeliverXNow.com, um, but I, this is a huge problem, uh, and I think it's one that it's really important that we try to get right. And so that's why I've been working in the space for the, the last uh, 15 years. Um, one of the things that sustainability and environmentalism has suffered from is it's the right thing to do. It's the idealistic thing to do. Um, but making data-driven decisions helps you prove, oh, this is the financially prudent thing to do. Oh, this reduce risk. This can help make sure that uh, your insurance premiums are lower, or you have longer retention of employees, or you have better relations with your stakeholders. And can you put a dollar value on that? And so within sustainability, that's a key part and has really made this shift. Um, and I also think education-driven innovation is extremely important. Uh, Kay talked about the Kiko Exchange, I think he was calling it, you know, sharing ideas from one another. Um, you know, I'm not making this up. I'll talk about stuff at the end. There's additional resources. Others have studied this. But it's so novel to me that analytics is such both a new industry in its infancy. You know, how do we structure analytics at companies? That there's only a few programs like MIDS here at Berkeley where you can get a graduate education in analytics and in data science. Uh, and so it's great for me because I get to talk about it and share some of my perspective. So what is an analytics operating model? Um, most executives are not analytically literate. They're not data scientists. They're not analysts. They're literate in communication, investor relations, and finance most of the time. They're not literate in analytics. And so when you talk to companies about being data driven, you really have to break that down. OK, yes, it's a l nice goal. Who's going to say they don't want to be data driven? Um, but how do you actually achieve that result? Because everyone wants the result. Not everyone wants the process to get there. So I'm going to break it down into four key parts. And you'll see I'll break down each of those four parts into their own parts. Um, the first is information architecture. This is the technologies, tools, software, applications, databases, et cetera, that your analytics depends on. And we recently heard about data engineering. It is so critical. You know, no one wants to be that person on the floor with the screwdriver, but unless you do that, <laughs> like it's, nothing is going to get done. Um, then there's organizational structure. Oftentimes, uh, especially after Harvard Business Review named data scientist the sexiest job title in the 21st century. I'm not sure Harvard is like the person to go to on sexy, but you know, they did it anyways. Um, they said, oh, we'll just hire data scientists. Let me just hire a bunch of them. They're coming out of mids. They have this PhD program. Like, oh, you have 10 years of experience with TensorFlow, even though TensorFlow has only been around for four years. <laughs> I'll hire you. Great. Um, so, but like, how do you, what do you do with those people? Where do they sit? You know, how does their supervisor check their work if their supervisor doesn't know Python? Or like, what's the correlation efficient? Oh, it's 95% accurate. You know what that means? You just made up the data. Like, <laughs> so how do you create an organizational structure that supports and enables data scientists? Um, the personnel, which I briefly talked on a little bit, what are the skills that you need and how those skills work together? And then the culture. Um, we talked about GitHub and version control, but also a culture of learning, a, a culture of being able to fail, uh, a culture of helping one another. 
So the right operating model is going to be include all four of these elements, but it's going to be different for each organization, depending on your size, depending on your current level of analytical maturity, depending on how data-driven do you want to be, um, and a whole bunch of other things. So breaking down those four elements, again, information architecture is the foundation, and it's so important. Uh, you don't have to live in earthquake country to know that your foundation for your house is important. You can't build something on top of something where there's no foundation. So I'm going to briefly talk about that. Organizational structure. I have an org chart here. It's not about who you report to. It's not about, oh, do you have a chief data officer? But it's really about how are the teams aligned and how do they enable one another. Um, personnel, both the personnel, the X's and O's, but also who's doing what where. Whether it's your offensive lineman knowing where to block, or a soccer team, uh, knowing who to pass to, or I'm a huge Warriors fan. You have to know what the other people are doing, even in a really fluid and dynamic environment. And then culture. Culture is not just about perks and having dinner at the office so that they can get you to work late. Uh, it's about much more than that, especially in an environment where people don't work at the same company for 40 years. So how can you get how do you either want to work someplace for a long time, you feel supported, you want to learn, there's opportunities for growth, or as a potential leader, how can you get really smart people to stay with you? And those investments that you make um, in their line of business, domain expertise, et cetera, can stay there. So there's going to be a lot on this slide. I'm just warning people. Um, I said it already, it's foundational and should be prioritized as such. I already talked about executives saying, oh, I want to hire a data scientist. Okay, great. What are they going to work on? Where is your data? How clean is it? Are you doing things in Excel? Because that is not data science. Um, all of this is information architecture. I'm going to slowly walk us through it, but it starts with acquiring and ingesting your data. Um, and for many legacy companies, companies not built online where they're tracking everything you do and all of that is data, for example, like PG&E, um, we now acquire over a billion data points a day, slightly more than eBay. But how well do we use it? You, know, you could. What's the difference between a billion and 500 million? You know, still increasingly overwhelming. Um, but unless you know what to do with it, you're just now collecting and paying for more server space. Um, as we go, following the white, it's the pipeline engineering. Okay, you have your data in the system of record. Now, how do you process it and get it in the structure that your analyst and data scientists need it in? Um, then you have space to do different types of analytics. One is your standard set of reports, things that you either publish monthly, daily, quarterly. The formula is not going to change. The process isn't going to change. If you have clean data, it, it's automatic. You shouldn't be having someone wasting their time generating that report. Um, but then there's spaces for experimentation. You know, many data scientists trans form and um, manipulate and run sorts of all sorts of algorithms on their data. Are they doing that here in your core data tables? Hopefully not, because I was a data scientist. We mess up a lot. <laughs> so hopefully you have a space for them to experiment. And then you're publishing the data. Um, this is the dashboard that the executive looks at. This is the compliance report that has to be done in the same way every month and sent out to your regulators. This is how you avoid having AI ethics issues, by having things documented. Now, we skipped over these colored steps. These are the processes. So this is the data, and I'm not going to tell you, oh, buy AWS, or one cloud is better, or whatever. This is the technology. These are the processes and steps that enable your data and make it really enhanced and curated data, and it's so much more valuable. 
data scientists, depending on which article you read, spend between 40 and 80 percent of their time cleaning data. These are some of the most expensive resources at a company outside of the C-suite, and you're having them, the same person is cleaning data over here, and they're also cleaning that data over here. It's through these processes that you improve that efficiency for your company and allow your data scientists to be deployed like the really efficient and expensive tools they are. Um, now, you can't build out this entire information architecture pipeline on day one. You can, and maybe you're better at raising money than I am, but most people really need to see results quickly. And so I would recommend, as you think about each of these steps, remember we broke down analytics operating model into four steps. This is the first one. Each of these is another step, and you can go even deeper. As you break it down, think about it iteratively. What can I achieve in the next month that will improve my analytics maturity, and I can prove to my executives, say, our data quality went from 50% to 75%. Give me more money so I can continue to invest in that. So the second part is organizational structure. And remember I said it's not actually about who you report to, is there a chief data officer, but it's about how are data scientists, data engineers, analysts organized within the company. I know there was a question about that during the last presentation. Most companies, especially really young companies, are like this. It's dispersed. There's really no logic. It's someone hired a data scientist, another person has an intern, um, other people change their title from analyst to data scientist or analyst to engineer, and there's very little coordination. This team doesn't actually have a data scientist, but they need analytical work, and they always go to this team to help them. Um, when you do research in the subject, there's another model called coordinated or federated where all of these teams informally work together through a council or a community of practice. Um, oftentimes, this is self-organized by the data scientists. Being a data scientist can be really lonely, and you can run into a lot of troubles with your data, and you reach out for help. Um, and you know, after you went to Stack Overflow and it doesn't look exactly like your problem, <laughs> you reach out to people at your own company and if that happens enough, now you just have a recurring meeting, and oh, let's invite this other team, and now you have a community of practice. Um, some of the most mature companies have what's called a hub and spoke model. I mean, that's what we're trying to implement at pg and &E. I will emphasize trying, because it is really difficult. Um, where you have a larger team of data scientists here in the hub, that develop your best practices, your standards, your language preferences. Oh, are we a Python company or are we an R company? Because just like the Mars lander, like you can't just combine those things at the end and have s metrics and inches on the Mars lander and then all of a sudden it crashes, right? Like you actually have to make those decisions and that's oftentimes what the hub does. Now, other companies have gone all the way and they say, I have enough political capital, our company's new enough, uh, we just went through a bankruptcy or whatever it is, and we're just gonna, <laughs> I'm self-aware, it's okay. <laughs> and we're gonna centralize all our analytical talent in one team, and they're gonna work on the, only the projects that the leader of this team says. What often happens when you have centralized groups is that all of a sudden you have these ghost analytics teams that pop up. It's like, oh, my thing didn't make the list. My project didn't make the list that the centralized team is working on. That's okay, I'll hire a consultant or a vendor to come in. I won't call it analytics, I'll call it IT enhancement. And um, I already have the budget approved and you know, the centralized team doesn't need to know. And then all of a sudden, Six months later, the contract expired from the vendor. Now you have this thing that's like 85% done, and you need someone, maybe you promise someone on the centralized team, hey, there's a promotion for you if you come work on this on, for me. 
Um, so centralized teams normally don't work, um, especially in a command and control environment when you're either really small or one leader at the company has the most power. They try to do centralized. Um, and again, it's not about the placement, but it's about how the teams work together. Um, and let's take the data engineering and data science, or analytics and IT, other companies split it down the line there. Um, what I've seen work really well is what I call the bicycle model. You actually have two hub and spokes. You have an analytics hub and spoke, and then you have an IT hub and spoke. Most IT teams don't know how to handle unstructured data. It's like, oh, first we moved everything from, to the cloud, and now you want us to do this unstructured stuff with images and different colors, and like, I don't know how to map that. That was not in Java 101 when I took it 20 years ago. Um, and so you have a team of specialists in IT that are propagating those same IT best practices that enable data science, as well as the data science best practices, and they really build off of each other. Um, and again, you may not be able to execute and switch, and many of you who have worked at large companies know that there is a cost to reorgs, even though they happen a lot. Um, you may be at dispersed. It will take you time to move between any of these. And I encourage you and your companies um, to do research before making a move. So one of the things is what types of analytics do you want to do? What types of data science do you want to do? Um, I break data science or analytics in general into four key parts, descriptive, diagnostic, predictive, and prescriptive, and I'll run through those really quickly. This is what happened. This is historically looking. Um, it's those reports that happen on a regular basis. Then there's why it happened. Oh, so you have this dashboard that the executives look at every month, and the trend line now is going in the wrong direction. Well, you have to do diagnostic analytics to figure out why it happened. Then it's predictive. Well, the trend line hasn't decreased yet, but we know we're not ready for the Black Friday sales or whatever it is. How do we prepare ourselves? That's predictive, what is gonna happen? And then prescriptive. It suggests actions that you should take based on your vision of the future. Now, artificial intelligence is not on this. And I know people love to call themselves AI specialists now. Uh, another job title I heard was, uh, I'm a data artist instead of data visualization. <laughs> it's like, if you want to be a data artist, fine. Um, artificial intelligence is a technique that you apply to one of these types of analytics. You can have artificial intelligence that generates a report that's descriptive. The AI script will look at the data that you look up the most, and oh, every, the first Monday of every month, you run this report. Okay, AI can figure that out and generate a report. But it can also do something prescriptive analytics. AI is a technique, not a destination. And that's one of the key things that I think uh, especially as lots of companies pick, pick up this language, those distinctions get really blurred. And especially in a space this new, we have to be really precise with our language. Okay, so the third part is personnel. Um, who's seen a children's soccer game before? Okay, um, so one of the things, before I get to the children's soccer game is, analytics is a team sport. We talked about someone just hiring a data scientist. You just hire a really smart person out of mids and they'll figure it out, right? Or, oh, let's get a team of four people. They'll figure it out um, without knowing how the people will interact. You need that data engineer, a data scientist, someone that specializes in clustering, someone that specializes in time series analysis because those are different types of techniques. Um, and unless you have some specialization and in a children's soccer team, everyone runs to the ball. <laughs> everyone is a forward. No one is a defender. <laughs> it's only the poor kid who's the goalie who stands back there and is like lonely looking at the butterfly. <laughs> okay? 
But you, in professional sports, you have specialization. You have someone that is a dedicated defender. And their skills are different from other people's. And in data science, this is the skill set you need. You need someone with expertise in statistics. That's a different skill from programming. You can have both skills, but they are different. Data engineering is a different skill from visualization. And unless your hiring managers understand these skill sets, they're hiring the person with the best resume. And you have to put together a team that complements each other. You can have someone who is an expert in visualization and doesn't know how to program if you set up your team where the other people have programming expertise. The Warriors are a great example. Built around Steph Curry. You have to have a big man with Steph Curry. You can't have five shooting guards all on the outside. You would score a lot of points, but you would also have a horrible defense. Um, and so you have to build your team both with specialization, but also planning and coordination between all of the parts. And then above all is practice, practice, practice. All sports require practice. And if you think about analytics as a team sport, you can't just hire a bunch of people, give them a big problem with a tight deadline, and expect that they deliver on time and that it's perfect. Um, you're going to have to practice, and you're going to have to fail. And that brings us to the last part here, which is culture. Um, and culture is set from leadership from the top down. It's set from the bottom up. But it's also set from middle out, if people are fans of Silicon Valley. Um, so these are some of the things that are critical to enabling a culture that embraces and promotes analytics and data-driven decision making. Well, admit when you don't know. And it's so critical that people don't feel, oh, if I say I don't know to my boss, it's going to come up in my annual review. Well, what is worse? Saying you don't know now, having time to figure it out, and then getting to the right answer? Or guessing, likely being wrong, and then you spend all of that time that was waste? So if you think about, take a step back, and saying you don't know is a good thing. It allows you to find that specialist in that domain and get their perspective. Um, now this becomes more important when you're making decisions versus like building apps, and there are different you know, goals for analytics. But when you're making a decision based on analysis, oftentimes there are a lot of assumptions. Those assumptions normally don't make it through the PowerPoint that the CEO sees. They might just see like one number and one color. And they're like, OK, yes, good decision. If they have questions, now it has to go all the way back down the chain, and it's two weeks later, and the moment's lost. So you have to have an analyst in the room. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these. Uh, this one is really important to me. Um, we, in the Valley, there's lots of talk about failing fast, and being iterative, and agile, and we're going to pivot, and all of this stuff. The end goal is not to fail. You don't want to. You want to fail so that you can learn. The end goal is actually learning so you don't make the same mistake again. So be comfortable with fail. You actually want to, maybe you intentionally fail. Be like, oh, there's a 2% chance that this thing will work. And the upside is so huge, we actually have to pursue it. But fail with purpose and know how you're going to transmit those learnings across the company. Because, OK, now you're failing, and the other team next to you, they're failing. But you're actually failing on the same thing without coordinating. And now you've just failed redundantly. Um, and then this one becomes so important. It's document like your life depended on it. Um, our team says, document as if you inherit the project after you had amnesia. It's like, and that includes inline documentation in your code, like what does this section do, so that your data engineers and your data scientists don't have to spend all day talking to each other. They definitely should talk, um, but they don't have to spend all day. And then you also have to document, like, what was the problem statement that kicked this whole thing off? 
Um, what are some of the assumptions? So documentation is really important. Um, I've learned a lot over the past 10 years working in this space, but here are some really great resources. I'll make sure the presentation is available for you to follow up and learn more about this space. Um, the Booz Allen Hamilton's Field Guide to Data Science, if you haven't read it, it should probably be required reading for some class here at MIDS. Um, it's really great and it really helps you understand how are executives thinking about data science. And so it's chock full of great interview questions for you to ask them um, for the students in the room. And then here are some benchmarks for the different ways analytics maturity um, and the analytics organizations are structured at some of the leading companies. So Visa went centralized, but they have a bunch of small centralized teams. Um, you could call that centralized or you could call it coordinated, whatever you want to do, um, but they call it centralized. Google, who's pretty well known for analytics and having lots of data, they do a hub and spoke model. And then Under Armour, who own Map My Fitness, they also do a hub and spoke model as well. And once one of the spokes becomes large enough and expertise enough, they actually spin it out and it creates its own hub. Um, so these are some resources for people to look at and that's it. Thank you very much. JP, that's great. Thanks. Thanks so much. We have time for five, six, seven minutes of questions. We've got a bunch of questions coming up. So let's go, uh, let's go right to the ones on the left there and then we'll come back. Love the talk. Uh, lots of great things pulled together, but I want to pull out one particular thing. On your first slide, you said you believe in data-driven decisions. Yes. How do you make a data-driven decision? So the first thing is that you have the information infrastructure to support the decision. You have the data there. Because so many decisions are based on gut feel, and executive is like, oh, I have this feeling. I'm going to send the analytics team out to confirm my hypothesis. And instantly, they're already like targeting a certain answer. Um, one key thing is having people follow the data where it leads, not where you want it to lead. Um, and being able to push back to an executive who has a hypothesis. That is one key thing. Um, you really need to let the data speak for itself. And if you don't believe the data, it doesn't mean that your data is not clean, because the data could be wrong. The data is true, but your interpretation of it might be wrong. And so you have to, it takes a certain amount of maturity to have that back and forth with a decision maker about what does making a data driven decision mean. Okay, we had a hand up right at the back there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the traditional uh, software engineering project, right, you have like an architect, you have a developer, and you have a QA team. Uh, but in an analytics uh, period, we only talk about data scientists and data engineers. Mm -hmm. uh, there is, we don't never talk about a QA team or a tester, right? So is that not required at all? Or how do we ensure like the quality of a uh, good analytic product? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. On um, my slide, I did have something called a technical project manager. And whether you're implementing an agile framework or a waterfall approach, QA should be part of your process. Now, whether you have a dedicated individual that does QA and that's all they do, or you rotate through that position and it provides individuals on your team an opportunity to learn the best practices of doing QA, that way when they do the work the next time, it's less effort on that person. Um, it's part of the process, doesn't necessarily have to be a role. Yep, just in front, yeah, thank you. <coughs> In driving a data-driven culture in a relatively less data-driven team, mm -hmm. what can I ask for from the leadership? So our situation right now is um, the team has an idea. They love the idea of being data-driven, but they don't know how to get there, and uh -huh. they're kind of half-hearted in uh, trying to get us there. So. Uh, uh, me and my sub-team team members, we have to be very specific about our asks. And I was wondering, what can I ask from my big boss to make this happen? Sure. So um, just hearing your example for 30 seconds, I would encourage you to look up 
Airbnb's university. They have a data university um, that they actually send all of their new hires through. Um, so they're trying to make a data-driven company. You know, they want to know, oh, um, how long should the description of the apartment be? How many pictures should you take? Um, where's the location that works best and that we can sell for the highest amount? And so they had analysts from HR, from location, from legal, trying to make these database decisions, but they didn't have access to the data. And their data engineering teams were swamped with data requests. And so one of the key parts of making a data-driven decision and having that data-driven culture is having access to the data. So if you think about the information architecture, you don't give everyone access to your core tables, but maybe you give them access to a copy of the table. Maybe you either buy or build a user interface that allows them to query the data themselves without having to write code. Um, so making, having a data-driven culture, the first step is getting access to the data. And I would encourage you to, A, look up Airbnb University, and then track how much time your teams spend trying to find the data. And oftentimes that happens on the data black market. It's like, oh, I know you have a copy of the data. It might be two weeks old, but like, that's better than what I have. It's in an Excel. It wasn't updated, whatever it is. Um, so it becomes really important. OK, let's uh, take ones there, and then we'll go across there. Hi. Um, so you gave a lot of good uh, structural components of how to, to I guess, uh, structure data science teams and analytics teams. I guess if we were coming in in a situation of an interview or to assess the overall, I guess, health of whatever structure is in place, what types of questions or metrics might you think would be appropriate for whatever model they're using to, uh, to figure out how well that model is operating? Sure. So I would ask them, how are your analytics teams structured? And if they say, oh, we, like, every, they're all over the place and we kind of coordinate, we have a Slack channel, <laughs> that means it's like dispersed. And that is OK, but you need to know going into it that I'm going to have to pull myself up from my bootstraps and do a lot of data engineering work in order to do my data science. And it's all about expectation management. If you know that going in and you're okay with it, then that's fine. So asking them how are their companies organized, asking them how they do QA or uh, version control, do they have Git or Bitbucket, and is that universal? Um, those are some of the key questions that will let you know like how mature are they as a company. Okay. Use the hand up over there. Yep, thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm a junior man data science manager, and a lot of what you said resonated with me. Uh, I think one of the struggles I've had is in managing a very diverse set of people with, with a lot of with skills that I don't have, or knowledge mm -hmm. in sp specialized uh, specialized knowledge that I don't have. And uh, you know, for time series modeling or neural networks, for example. Um, and I find it very challenging to manage such a diverse range of skill sets. Curious to hear at, at PG&E how, how your team thinks about that and in training junior managers to manage that and, um, and how to get your, folk, uh, your folks to rise up to the managerial challenge when it's their turn. Yeah, I mean, that is a great question um, that is not unique to analytics, but you know, hiring someone smarter than you then how do you like check their work and make sure that they're doing the right thing? One of the steps I've taken is hiring a bunch of people smarter than me and then having them all check each other's work. <laughs> um, and I say it jokingly, but like that is actually part of our QA process is you have to present to three other data scientists and they have a bunch of questions and they give a go, no go decision. Um, and if you can't convince your peers, and if you can't explain your model, then what are you doing running it? That's how you end up with ethics issues. So if you can't explain it to other data scientists and have them understand it and accept it, that is one of the key things that I found really helpful. Right. JP, thanks very much. Please Thank join you me very in much. Thank you.